Sterne Fontaine, a charming walled town called the Pearl of the Comtat, possesses an extraordinary legacy of over 40 fountains dating for the most part from the 18th and 19th century. Four of these fountains are classed as historic monuments like the famous Cormorant Fountain. Nadine Rogeret lives and works near here. She passionately restores Bouti, the white Provencal bed covers. These beautiful creations are traditional and are made in plastic colors. Et, et What's this marvel you're working on here? I'm working at the moment on this Bouti from the time of Napoleon. A Bouti is a bed cover. It's a work of art. It's a sculpture on cloth. C'est une sculpture sur tissu. Ce qui what interests me with the booty is the way the material is sculpted to give the relief, partly traditional, partly the way it's done. By respecting this method of working, this knowledge, one can adapt it to our life today. So in a society where everything goes fast, one needs, through one hands, to go against the current and perpetuate history whilst enjoying oneself. So the booty is a method of work. But the bed cover is created according to the booty method used. And then it is the instrument, the booty, a needle which gives its name to the work, which gives its name to the method of work by which it's achieved. How many layers do you have? It is two layers of cotton. The top layer is cambric, underneath it's hemp, and the middle is stuffed with cotton stuffing. And how do you put the design on the material? We use a cotton cambric, two thicknesses, the top one and the bottom one. On the top one the design is put on with a paper pencil. You start by reproducing the design. The cotton cambric of the booty is never washed until the booty is finished and ready for use. Mm. Because it tightens the threads of the material. Mm. You only wash it when all the stitching and stuffing mm. has been finished. With booty, one always gets a bit of shrinkage. So when I take a square of cotton, I know I'll get at least 15% of shrinkage at the end. Pour le rétrécissement. The more a booty plus is washed and boiled, the whiter it gets. Bouillir, plus il restera blanc, mm. et plus il aura and the nicer it looks on the bed. Sur le lit. Uh, ça traverse it can last for many generations. generations. And how do you know it's an antique si booty? C'est un vrai um, booty ancien. Et un a real booty antique booty can be recognized by its transparency. Ce qui est it's magnificent when you hold it up to the daylight. Du jour, on voit toute la you can toute see the transparency and all the work at that moment. À ce moment -là. Voyez là, you see et here et this booty, booty that I'm restoring. It's interesting because you can see the stuffing is not transparent here because over the years the stuffing has got crammed down in a corner. And I'm filling up the empty space to give it a second life. In all forms of restoration, the idea is to give the object a longer life. En passant, donc, and with booty, you have to work in a methodical manner from the bottom to the top. Ça, de bas en haut, je répare, I repair en all the points, points that have split. Pour, uh, ceux qui ont craqué. Et dans ces espaces, and in all the quilted bits, I stick my needle in with the stuffing like this. En double, comme ceci, voilà. en faisant attention you have to pay attention pas not to do it in the wrong direction. And I finish it like this. Voilà. Je complète... Avec les petits With little curved scissors, I cut very close to the material. And with a small slither of olive wood, I push home salle, the stuffing across the thickness. This part is well liché. stuffed. I will go je to a part where I feel with my thumb that it still needs stuffing. Voilà. 
Je vois par transparence or when I see the transparency of the beak of this bird which I've stitched. Now I need to fill the empty part. Comme si je I've outlined it with my needle. I need always to think of that. Pointu, it's pointed like the beak. I start with the curved part, pointing, pointing my needle towards the point of the beak pour bien to continue the design so that it really looks like a beak. Do you talk while you work? Yes, of course. Tongues are loosened. They say the first feminine movements were born in that period. The men were not suspicious. And the women during this time told their life stories very vividly and ardently. Whilst they did their embroidery. <laughs> Here's a booty which I'm working on. It has a design put on it by tracing paper which has been perforated by a needle. So that the pencil comes through on the material. The borders are turned over and sewn up. It's very important that the borders are finished before you start. And after that, I start the stuffing. You see the transparency in the booty, in the petals of the pansies and the gullies. We call that spaghetti. We always keep the names of pasta. When they are long, they are spaghetti, and when they are square, ravioli, and when they are round, vermicelli. But Nadine, how do you know which is the front because it's exactly the same? It is exactly the same. But not not to see the stuffing or where it's been. Who did that? It was me. It's incredible. It's it's really impossible to tell which is the front. You ought not to be able to see. If you can see, it isn't finished. It always has to look like that. But you know which is the front. Is it this side? It's this side, I know, because the knot of the basket is on the right. But is that the only reason? Yes, that's the only reason. But when you touch it like that, it's hard. Because it has to be washed, washed and washed for a long time without ruining it. Watch, here comes a little masterpiece. A very, very beautiful booty. Saint Didier, a quiet little Provençal village, has its picturesque views, its churches, its chateau, its ochre houses and its fountains with flowing cool water. As in the olden days, they still make nougat in the traditional way. This confection dates from the grandparents of the Sylvan brothers who were born on this farm. Philippe and Pierre Sylvan have planted their own almond trees and have developed the production of nougat. That's what makes us different from other nougat makers. We produce ourselves the almonds, which are essential for our nougat, almonds and honey, and have you bees. Here we have 150 hives which allows us with our 2,000 almond trees to produce nearly 10 tons of nougat a year. And what is the difference between the two types of nougat, the white and the black? The difference between the white and the black nougat is essentially the way of working the honey. With white nougat, it's stirred very gently for three hours in a bain-marie. 
And with black nougat, it's cooked very quickly, so it's caramelized and the honey is dark. We are particularly attached to black nougat because we remember our childhood and Christmas Eve with its 13 desserts and the memory of grandmother making her nougat, and we were allowed to pick up the little bits. <laughs> and that's for Christmas. It's a Provencal tradition for Christmas. We work as a family. We are six people, my mother, my wife, my sister-in-law, my brother for making the nougat and selling it. And then we hope, the next generation, the next generation. <laughs> All the ingredients come from here, the honey and the almonds, not the sugar because it's cane sugar. Is the temperature secret? Yes, that's what gives a good balance, the nougat. When you eat nougat, your teeth fall out. That's not good nougat, that's not well done. And that's orange and cognac. There, a little bit more. It's an old Provençal tradition. It's eaten at supper on Christmas Eve, just before midnight mass, where they have 13 desserts. And in those 13 desserts, there's black nougat, and the black is made before. In years gone by in Provence, there were lots of almond trees. People picked a few almonds, they had a high for the honey. It was very simple to cook the honey with almonds. Each family made their own nougat. So we improved a little on the recipe of our grandmother. We added a bit of sugar because grandmother's nougat was made for Christmas. And afterwards, because there was a lot of honey, it began to run. It was necessary to keep it for a long time in a stable state. The almonds and then the honey from here, honey from flowers, honey from the shrubland, honey from rosemary. Another member of the family, my sister-in-law. The black nougat is a bit special because it goes off very quickly. The more it cools, the more you have to work. It's for that reason. Is this paper edible? It's communion wafer. Good. It's the best. Pierre, passionate about bees since he was a boy, looks after the hives. These hives are for the honey for the nougat, yes, and you look after them. It's me who looks after the hives, over 200 of them. 200? 200 hives. And at the moment they're making honey from spring flowers. It's honey that is dark and used for making black nougat. It's specially for black nougat. The honey is harvested around the 20th of June, and it's the honey of flowers, all flowers, and it is dark. After the 20th of June, the hives are transported to the Luberon, into the lavender fields. From there we make lavender honey, which is used for making white nougat. It is a honey which is very clear, very perfumed, and used for white nougat. 
Also in Saint Didier works Bernard Raymond, the man who talks to the birds. He is the fourth generation of whistle makers. Always with the same passion, he observes the birds and plies his trade. In his workshop are all sorts of whistles of all kinds of shapes and sizes, unique models made from different sorts of materials, brass, beechwood, boxwood, hornbeam or bone. With true good nature and typical Provencal warmth, he guides the curious round his little family museum. The plover is a little wader. It's the whistle that takes the longest to make. It has to be handled 14 times whilst it's being made. The owl, the screech owl. Here, a bit of split wood with split twine inside. The blackbird. For the blackbird, there are several whistles. A whistle that you have to tap. This here is also for the blackbird. In the spring, when he goes to see his fiancée, he's dressed and has new slippers. He sings like this. When he goes to sleep or when he's afraid, he sings like this. That's the goldfinch, the whistle is minou, a piece of wood and a piece of lead. The interaction of the lead inside the wood makes the sound. The robin redbreast. And the nightingale. The sparrow. The whistle is made of hide and inside is horsehair. They wanted to change the horsehair by putting foam and synthetic horsehair, but it didn't work and now we use real horsehair again. With the same whistle I can do the green finch, the same but much faster. The musical thrush, which is called a tawn, sings like this, very shrill. When she's calm and calls her fellows, she has a very impressive song. It's for that she's called a musician. And for me, if you like, this duck is a duck from the Bois de Boulogne. And in spite of being a musician, I say to myself, I'm going to do the Pavarotti of ducks. <laughs> Even though there's nothing to see with it. One calls that a hoopoo. That's to say the hoopoo is a bird that smells because he makes his nest in horse droppings. He does it like this. With the same whistle it's possible to imitate the title music of a film. That's the fox. So to call a fox you have to imitate a wounded rabbit like this. The fox, when he hears this, he goes out and arrives with a napkin, a knife and a fork, and he even takes a pot of mustard. This whistle lets you call a deer, that's to say I imitate the sound of a female deer at the moment of coupling. When the female looks for a male, she makes a little moan, like a baby crying. With the same whistle, I can imitate a chicken when it's going to lay an egg. A hen who lays an egg goes like this. Here. And the wild boar. And this whistle is entirely wood. And when I blow it, it's a wild boar. The hands are very important. It's necessary to play with the hands. What kind of people would use a whistle like this? Who uses a whistle? Yes. Everyone. The hunter less and less, the ornithologist, the sound recordist, the photographer. More and more the discovery of nature, and for the last two or three years it's being used by centers for children with memory problems. Who conceived it? Who invented it? Whistles have always existed in history. Very rough whistles served our ancestors. But the inventor of the first artisan factory for bird whistles was my great-grandfather, which he did when he was 17 years old in 1868, which is 150 years ago. 
In the beginning, when he was young, he was always in the woods listening to the birds, and he wanted to recreate the sound of these birds. He was so good at it that he made whistles for his friends. And then one day he said, this is a business, and he made his first bird whistle for sale. Today there are five makers in the world. Two are in France, Raymond's workshop and one of an old worker of his grandfather. After that, there's one in Italy, one in Spain, and one in America. This is the Cos Carpentra for centuries was a well-known market for birds all over Europe. And my grandfather and great-grandfather sold their wares in the market. The Italians and Spanish visited the market. They bought all the whistles made by the Raymond Atelier and then reproduced them. There you are. <laughs> That one's louder than that one. I'll have to work it inside. The tools are really rudimentary. Look, I push it there and it works. There you are. The most work is from September to January because that is when everyone buys whistles. With the lovers of nature and the hunter, it's necessary to produce a very great number. With all the sales merged, 120,000 whistles leave my workshop. 120,000? It often means I have to start at 4 o'clock in the morning. Go on. <laughs> That one's past it. So when the insert's no good, I have to take it out. The whistle is for communicating with a bird, and if the bird is on the branch of a tree, you would better know how to use your whistle. Otherwise, the bird will fall from the tree on its back with its feet in the air, and it will die laughing. <laughs> Perhaps they're waiting for a bit of bread and butter. There you are. Yes, yes. There are two, a male and a female.